Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event. I'm so glad that you can all be here, although uh, virtually not in person as originally hoped. Um, this is part of the Summer of Social Impact series run by the Harris School. And as I hope most of you know, the Harris School is devoted to bringing an analytical, evidence-based perspective to public policies to solve some of the world's toughest problems. And right here in Chicago, we have a wide range of partnerships with government agencies, with stakeholders, to try to bring the academic and analytical expertise of our faculty in partnership with stakeholders who understand how programs work on the ground and what community needs are to really try to accelerate the innovation cycle in public policy. And today's discussion is going to be a wonderful opportunity to dive into one of the most important issues facing our community and communities around the world, which is educational opportunity, equity, and achievement. Now, in the middle of COVID, you might think that that's what I was going to say about the most important issue facing our community and so many others. But of course, COVID has laid bare so many um, problems and inequities in so many systems around the world. I work on healthcare, that's obviously one, but COVID and the education realm have intersected to show us what differences there are in people's access to educational opportunities and has probably widened a lot of the gulfs that so many people are trying to close. So this is an opportunity to talk about how we can think about public policy to address pre-existing challenges in our education system, challenges exacerbated by COVID and hopefully the development of new opportunities that will have positive lasting impacts as we, I hope, exit this COVID period. Um, the last year really upended education for so many Americans and kids around the globe. And that upending had very disparate impacts on different communities and people with different resources. And this is really an opportunity to dive into what we can do as a community and what things have been working and what things haven't been working to help close those gulfs. You'll hear about some of the work that has implications in Chicago, of course, which is where so much of our work takes place, but also for so many other educational systems. And we'll learn about how we can evaluate what's working and not working at the same time that we're implementing things at scale so that we can figure out what's pragmatic on the ground, not just in the ivory tower. And that's one of the things that's wonderful about the partnerships you'll hear about today. So before we get to some of that really exciting conversation, I'd like to introduce uh, Jens Ludwig, with whom I'm going to have the privilege of having a fireside chat. There will then be a panel of policymakers, practitioners, implementers, and then there'll be time for some open discussion. So Jens Ludwig um, joins me. He's the Edwin A. and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. We're proud. Uh, he's director of the University of Chicago's Crime Lab, co-director of the Education Lab. He also, in his spare time, co-directs the National Bureau of Economic Research Working Group on the Economics of Crime. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. I could go on, but we have a short period of time and I have a lot of questions for Jens. His work has touched on uh, the role of social conditions in children's schooling outcomes, predictive policy school, um, predictive policy tools, early childhood education, gun violence prevention, so many pressing issues. He works, of course, with the city of Chicago, but also with the city of New York through the Crime Lab and has really harnessed the tools of economics, of psychology, of computer science to try to drive better educational outcomes for everyone in our community. So it's an honor to be joined by you here today. Thank you, Jens. Thanks, Kate, for having me, and thanks for the very kind introduction. Well, I would love to start off hearing more about the Education Lab, how it's designed, how you approach these set of problems. The, the mission of the lab is to partner with civic and community leaders to identify, test, and help scale the programs and policies with the greatest potential to improve human lives. One of the things that I love about the work of the lab and so many others around the university is that sometimes you're surprised by things that seem like they ought to work, that sound like great ideas, but don't actually work. Or conversely, things you think, well, that's never gonna fly and it turns out to have an enormous impact. Can you tell us a little bit about things that have been surprising to you in your work, findings that have changed the way you've thought about a particular program or a particular problem? Yeah, let me, um... 
maybe let me just start off a, a little bit about uh, why we started the education lab, and then I can I can talk a little bit about what's what surprised us. So, you know, if you um, if you turn the dial back 50 years, social science in many ways is a very different field from things like medicine or the natural sciences. Um, if you turn the clock back 50 years, you can see quotes from people like the president of the Social Science Research Council at the time talking about how social science isn't really about solving social problems. It's about um, observing social problems. Um, and you know, I'm a first generation college student myself. I had no idea what social science was before I went off to, to college. And as I started to get into this field, this was maybe one of the biggest surprises to me. I'd imagine social so science is to social problems as like oncology is to cancer, that people wake up every day asking themselves how they can, um, how they can solve these problems and make the world a better place. And we just don't, haven't had that tradition in social science historically. And the reason that we started the education, you can see over the last 50 years that there has been a little bit of shift in the social sciences, but I think not nearly enough given the scale of the social problems that we're solving. And I think implicit in this hypothesis is that one of the reasons that we have so many of the social problems we currently have, there's a long list of reasons. We don't have enough resources. Politics are very complicated, but I think at the heart is also a firm belief, I certainly believe this myself, that um, we also don't know nearly enough about what to do to solve these problems. And I'll just give you one example that's been a big surprise to me is one of the, um, one of the conventional wisdoms that we've been starting to see uh, develop uh, in the social sciences and in adjacent fields is this uh, idea that uh, kids who are very early in their life course are very developmentally plastic, and that's a particularly productive time to intervene and try and turn their lives around, But which is true and a great, uh, a great insight, but I think that that's come with kind of a conventional wisdom coda that adolescence might be too late to substantially turn people's life chances around and um, remediate academic uh, challenges that have been accumulating over long periods of time. And I think some of the work that we've been lucky enough to do with the Chicago Public Schools and other partners, I think has really turned that conventional wisdom on its head. And I think con confirms to me the fact that the world is full of surprises and the key, one of the keys to better public policy and making the world a better place is a data-driven approach that helps us just understand the, the world much better than we currently do. Can you give an example of an intervention deployed in that post-early childhood stage that has been effective, whether it's yours or someone else's? I'd love to hear about an example of a, a really successful intervention. Yeah, let me. Maybe what I'll do is, uh, as a as a lead into this, let me say a little bit about. Um, uh, I'll talk about an intervention that I think we're really excited about, and our Chicago public school partners are really excited about. But let me maybe start with um, the, the motivation for this in, in the current context. And, you know, I think in, in some ways, the, the, the punchline to what I'm about to say is as, as worried as you are about what the pandemic has done to children's schooling status and, and futures, you are almost surely not worried enough. And I, you know, I think, I think that there are um, two reasons for that. One is that nobody knows exactly how much pandemic-induced learning loss there's been exactly. Um, you know, I think we we have an imperfect sense of the digital divide, a problem that has been severe and predated the pandemic, but increased dramatically in importance during the pandemic, um, and something that even despite lots of hard work we haven't been able to remediate during the pandemic, unfortunately. And when you look at maps of Chicago and um, so many other cities, we can see the inequity and unfairness in the digital divide. It's concentrated on the South and West sides in Chicago, for instance, in the neighborhoods where the kids who already needed the most help um, uh, were, uh, were concentrated. And 
the um, I think the the other challenge with the pandemic though is harder to see than the digital divide, which is the degree to which remote learning is an imperfect substitute for in-person learning. You know, that's something that we just don't really understand as a as a field. It probably varies a lot across districts and probably varies a lot across schools within a district. And it surely varies within a school across kids. And nobody knows how much that has compounded the digital divide for starters. So even the kids who've been able to connect, to what degree have they really fallen behind? Because of the pandemic, it goes, I think, as everybody will know, we didn't do a lot of standardized testing in our public schools uh, systems in the spring. And so we're entering this next academic year in some sense blind. We don't really have a sense for exactly what the new magnitude of the needs uh, the needs are. And I think that poses a particular challenge to districts in doing their policy planning if they don't know exactly what they what problem exactly they need to solve. Now, I think the um, the I think but the main reason in, in many ways, so this leads to the intervention that I think we're particularly um, motivated to try and figure out whether it really works as much as we hope and, and how to scale it. I think the main reason that people are probably not, um, uh, even as, as concerned as people are about pandemic related learning loss, why they might not be concerned enough, is we don't quite appreciate in some sense what sort of a treadmill the schooling system is, if that makes sense. You know, if you sort of imagine you're on a treadmill, if you've ever been on a treadmill, and you just stop moving, it creates huge problems and you wind up getting thrown off the thing. And, and so in some sense, the importance of continuing, continual forward movement is the, if you think about a public school system, you know, imagine that you're a kid who is set to enter 10th grade next academic year. So in two weeks, right? Um, for you, if you're about to start 10th grade, the pandemic started roughly halfway through your eighth grade year. Now, some of the kids, the fortunate kids, have been able to stay somewhere more or less on track and are more or less at grade level as they go ahead and they enter 10th grade. And so now when they get into their class of 25 or 30 students and the teacher gets up in front of the class and starts teaching 10th grade material, they will be at an academic level where they will be able to engage with the content what the teacher is is teaching and the the system continues as it as it needs to um but imagine that you're a kid who doesn't have internet access or imagine that you're a kid for whom remote learning really is a highly imperfect substitute for in-person learning um it is possible unfortunately for some unknowable share of kids some unknowable number of kids that they are entering 10th grade effectively with eighth grade academic skills. Now, put yourself in the position of the 10th grade teacher whose job is to take a classroom of 30 students and from September 2021 to June 2022, teach all those kids 10th grade material, which itself is a challenging enough task as it is. Now, on, so, the, the system and normal classroom instruction is not really designed to be able to personalize instruction to the degree that we may need to now in a world in which there's a lot of variability across kids in the degree to which the pandemic has really thrown them off track. And so I think very front and center in, in our thinking and in our conversations with our Chicago Public Schools part partners, as you'll hear in a minute, has been how do we think about personalizing instruction much more than we uh, than we have. And so I think that's sort of the larger theme of what what you'll hear about and what we've been really focused about, focused on. So is personalizing education something that is a, an implementable possibility for a school system that is as big and strained as Chicago Public Schools? How do you do that at scale? How do you get the the resources, but how do you also get the human capital bandwidth to be able to personalize education for kids who are at such different places? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, there's nothing, um, 
there's nothing pedagogically novel about the idea of personalization. So if you go back to, if you look at what they were doing at Oxford University in England in the in the 1200s, they knew at the time that personalized attention personalizes instruction. You know, if you were at Oxford, you would put on whatever the robe is, you would go to your professorial tutorial and it would be you and a professor and they would perfectly tailor, perfectly personalize instruction to exactly where you were at the time and to your pace of learning. And so we've known, and then over the next 800 years, we've confirmed that that is the best way to teach anyone anything. The problem is that that's enormously expensive, right? And so the, the scientific problem has been not to figure out how you teach people things as effectively as possible, but rather how you do that within this cost constraint of real world public school systems at, at very large scale. And, you know, I think one of the genius insights that our um, Saga education partners, who you'll hear from in the, in the panel after this, one of the genius insights that, um, that they had was the recognition that, you know, when you reduce class size enough, at some point, the reduction in class size becomes so quali it qualitatively changes the whole nature of what instruction means. If you look at surveys of teachers and what they say is hard about their job, they point to personalizing instruction for different kids and they talk about classroom management. And those are so challenging. That's why teachers need lots of years and years of pedagogical training before they come uh, teachers. And that's why we see such a sharp on the job learning curve for teachers. So each year over your first three years of teaching, you become no noticeably better because even with that training, it's so hard. There are a bunch of things that you just have to learn in the classroom. And Saga Education's hypothesis was that people can be very good at tutoring because it's a qualitatively different job that simplifies so many of the, that it's still challenging, but it strips away some of the uh, particularly difficult challenges that you can basically be good right, right away or with four weeks of training rather than four years of, of training and three more years of on the job learning. And so Saga can hire paraprofessionals as kids right out of college, for instance, who are willing to do this for a year as a, as a public service or mid-career switchers who want to do social good for a year before they go on to their next thing to take paraprofessionals for a year get them to do this at a living wage, basically a stipend. And um, that is a way to deliver what you might think of as like Oxford style personalized tutorials at, you know, big city public school system prices. And um, the results have been, to, to my mind, I'd be curious to, to hear what the audience thinks and what the panel uh, uh, thinks during the Q&A, but the results so far have been really quite um, remarkable in my mind and um, enormously heartening where, you know, we can see that uh, giving kids these sort, this sorts of, of high dosage tutoring can, you know, roughly double or even triple the amount of, of we did, we've done it in math with um, high school and middle school kids in, in Chicago and it doubles or triples the amount of math that they can learn over the course of the year. And now I think the big challenge that you'll hear about with our uh, Chicago Public School partners is now, how do we think about greatly expanding the scale of this, given the enorm, even before the pandemic, there was enormous need and the need has just increased, you know, by some unknowable, but surely enormous amount on the heels of the pandemic. So how does that kind of approach then translate to graduation rates? You've done some uh, exploration of what the causes and consequences of dropout from high school are. I know there are a lot of different projects that aim to reduce the dropout rate. What have you seen um, being effective there and what's the implication for lifetime earnings and well-being? Yeah, you know, one of the, uh... I think that, you know, you, you read a lot about um, newspaper reporters love to write stories about the, um, you know, the, the kid who went to college and then winds up in some job that's not as lucrative as you might normally associate with a college degree. And so 
it's it's a very man bites dog sort of story to find someone who gets education and then and then it doesn't pay off in the labor market. But the data shows you that not just college is a great investment, but high school diplomas are enormously valuable for uh, for kids as well. And in part because not having a high school diploma in the modern knowledge economy is so difficult, right? And so, you know, I think one of the things that I hadn't really quite realized before I spent so much time um, in the education field and looking at the data and talking to the, you know, so many of the educators that you'll hear about next is how there are such critical kind of um, uh, life turning points for kids that we need to make sure is right. And so one of the reasons that we've been focused on math among kids, especially in sort of that ninth or 10th grade window is what we can see in so many public school systems around the country that the failure to, to pass um, required ninth grade math classes, usually algebra one in many public school systems, the failure to pass ninth grade math really, if you, it, it's something like triples or quadruples the chances that you drop out of high school. And partly, we don't know exactly why that is, partly because it's it could be so deflating to kids, it changes their self-conception, unfortunately, about what they're capable of. Um, and the other reason is that it turns out to be, in many, many school systems across the country, it turns out to be surprisingly difficult to make up classes once you failed them. You would think that that would be something that, the systems would be geared up to make as easy as possible. And unfortunately, when you look around the country, it can often be surprisingly difficult. So that's one really, really critical kind of gatekeeping moment that we need to get right. And so we've been really focused with our public school partners on, on solving that. And the other one that I would just very quickly mention that has a similarly profound impact on kids' lifetime dropout risk and, and future earnings prospects is third grade literacy. You know, I think that all of the research shows that if we can't get kids to be able to, to be confident readers by the end of third grade, that has a similar sort of tripling or quadrupling adverse impact on the, uh, on the dropout risk. And I think, so those have been really two of the key points. This is something that our Saga education friends remind us of every time we talk to them. And, and I think it's, it's, um, uh, you know, these education problems can often seem overwhelming, like we've got to fix everything. And I think having sort of two high leverage points to focus on for starters, in many ways is is very optimistic and gives us a place to focus our energies. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about public policy around public education and think about the decision making process for curriculum for whether kids are going back to school over the summer and have an opportunity to make up those things, how you deal with a huge disruption like COVID and what resources are available. All of these decisions in many cities are made by school boards that are populated by people who aren't particularly educators. Chicago is moving over towards an elected school board. How do you see the governance of school systems playing into the policies that are on the ground and how how does that affect the way that you're able to partner with a school system, whether it's Chicago or elsewhere, to help think about innovation in policy? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, I think this is one of the, um, I think the thing that you're touching on, Kate, is one of the things that makes public policy such a, um, not just such an important field, but such a, a rich field and um, an intellectually complicated and scientifically challenging field. So. One of the big, one of the big movements that we've seen in public policy, not just in the United States but, but around the world to varying degrees, has been the shift towards evidence-based policy. Um, and we've seen in medicine enormous successes. So life expectancy has been, around the world has basically doubled since 1900, and we think that a large part of that has come from this very data-driven approach in medicine. And so I think there's a lot of interest in thinking about how we can. Um, aspirationally have similar sort of gains in, in other areas, including education. And, and the sort of evidence-based orientation, it's basically learning from experience in lots of different places on average, right? It's accumulating data and looking at central tendencies. And these are the sorts of things that tend to help 
lots of people across lots of places uh, on average. And that sits in a little bit of tension with another tradition that we have in lots of policy areas, particularly in education, which is the idea that the, um, the right sort of policy solution is often local or, or varies across different local contexts, right? And so I think, you know, one of the things that we've, so we've really made it a priority at the education lab to work very closely with, with public sector partners, partly so that when we find promising, you know, when we're able to, to partner and find promising results, if we're doing that hand in glove with public sector agencies from the beginning, that increases the chances that the public sector partner will implement that at scale because they also have been involved in producing this and so on. But I think the other reason that that is so valuable is it helps not just keep us focused on the most important problems, because that's what the public sector partners will uh, hopefully be, be prioritizing, but also it is a way to help ensure that we are um, focused on and attentive to the idea that the local context really matters as, as well. It sort of grounds everything that's being done in a way that sitting in a university office often doesn't, right? And, and so I think um, we're very grateful to be able to, to, to do this sort of work. And I think the, you know, to the extent to which social science is going to contribute to making the world a better place over time, I think that kind of back and forth between communities who understand what's right for what sort of solutions and what sort of trade-offs among different candidate solutions are best for them. And sort of the, the data and what the data can tell us about what the trade-offs are of different candidate solutions, it's going to have to be much more of a kind of a, a communal kind of policymaking process than, than a one-way sort of policymaking process. That makes a lot of sense and, and leaves me time to ask one more question, which is, you know, you, you've highlighted the importance of evidence that's informed by local conditions and vice versa. Of course, all aspects of people's lives are intertwined from education to health to the environment they live in to housing to economic opportunity to public safety. How do you think about interventions through one entry point in the complicated intertwined world that people live in? And how do you think about those silos affecting each other and how that should affect our um, policy interventions and our evaluations of them? You yeah. should be able to answer that in two minutes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. You know, I think that, um, on, on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, everything is connected with everything else, right? The we, you know, the the data tells us that the the most important protective factor against risk of gun violence involvement is a high school diploma. At the same time, research by people like uh, Pat Sharkey at Princeton show us that exposure to community gun violence among young children has very, very big negative impacts on mental health and schooling outcomes. And so these things affect one another. But, you know, I think that the the idea that everything affects everything can, um, through a certain lens, lead to despair that I think can be counterproductive. And so if I, I, I'm a fundamentally optimistic person, or at least I, I think I'm a fundamentally optimistic person. And so my take on this is a little bit different you know, what we've seen in our work over the last 10 years at the education lab and the crime lab are examples. So the reason that I think everything affects everything can be so uh, can be so dispiriting is it makes you think that you need to fix everything at once. And I think we've seen lots of examples where that's not true. So, you know, when we work with Saga Education, for instance, in the Chicago Public Schools and we run high dosage tutoring demonstrations, we can see that students learn a lot more. When we work with youth guidance and they're becoming a man program, we can see that there are gains in high school graduation rates and reductions in violent crime arrests. Um, the, the optimistic take, so what that tells you is you don't need to change everything, but the fact that everything is connected to everything highlights that there are knock-on or spill-on benefits 
beyond the things that you are focused on. So for instance, with our work with Youth Guidance and the Becoming a Man program, we got there through a route where, you know, this started under the Richard uh, M. Daly administration, and we were all focused on gun uh, youth, youth violence at the time. That was the primary outcome that I think we were all hoping to change, and, and fortunately it did. But, you know, if you can help kids navigate the challenges that lead them to, you know, uh, lead them to be, uh, have heightened exposure to risk of violence involvement, it turns out that that also has really big secondary benefits for high school graduation as well. And so, you know, everything affects everything means that in many cases, even just getting one thing to go really, really well, it sort of turns the negativity on its head, getting on its head, getting one thing to go really well can create a virtuous cycle. And I think that's sort of the optimistic take that I try and have on this and it feels like a perfect place to uh, wind down the conversation on, a, on an optimistic note. Like Indeed, thank you for taking the time to share some of those insights. I'm really excited for the conversation to come. And so I wanna turn the microphone over to Trayvon Braxton, who's going to introduce the next panel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Dean Baker and uh, Jens. Um, so again, just wanna welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so as Dean Baker mentioned, my name is Trayvon Braxton and I'm a research manager at the UChicago Education Lab. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce our three esteemed panelists um, who will be joining us. Um, and our panel today will discuss the longstanding partnership between the UChicago Education Lab, SAG Education and the Chicago Public Schools and our collective effort to investigate the effectiveness of high doses tutoring within CPS, share some of the findings from that collaboration, um, as well as share some insights that can be taken from this work as we collectively look ahead to supporting students in this current um, ever-changing and evolving educational landscape. Um, so our first panel for today will be Dr. Shirley Chuveria, who is the Chief of the Office of Teaching and Learning at Chicago Public Schools. So um, Dr. Chuveria is a bilingual urban school leader with 10 years of educational experience serving as an educator and administrator focused on equity and access to the classroom, school, and district level. Prior to her current role, um, Dr. Chuvaria served as a deputy chief of the Office of Teaching and Learning, where she focused on advancing the district's commitment to academic progress through major initiatives such as the Curriculum Equity Initiative. And prior to that, she served as the principal for William P. Nixon Elementary School and spent her tenure building trust throughout her school community while developing a shared instructional vision, strengthening community relations and activities, and improving the school's operational functioning. As a principal, Dr. Chuvaria was also a member of multiple district leadership committees, including the Principal Advisory Council, SQRP Steering Committee, Instructional Equity Working Group, and Leadership Framework Working Group at CPS. Um, Dr. Chuvaria was a teacher at National Teachers Academy, where she was recognized for her leadership with the Madeleine Moraldi Award for Teacher Leader Excellence. She holds a bachelor's degree from Stanford um, in psychology and cultural social um, anthropology. A, major's degree, a master's degree, excuse me, in teaching from National Lewis University and a doctorate in education from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, our second panelist will be Mr. Antonio A.J. Gutierrez, who is the co-founder and chief of marketing and communications at SAG Education. Um, A.J. grew up in the Villa Victoria neighborhood, a Puerto Rican community in Boston South End. He graduated from Union College with a full educational scholarship through the Posse Foundation. And after graduating from Union in 2010, he served as a city year core member in Boston before joining Match Education School in Boston in 2011 to launch the Tutor Dissemination Unit there with alongside Alan Safran, where he focused on cultivating and establishing school and district partnerships and supporting the startup implementation of the program at all their partner locations. He received his MBA from Boston University's Question School of Business, specializing in public and nonprofit management. Um, and AJ co-founded SAG Education in 2014, which is a nonprofit organization that specializes in developing scalable, personalized learning solutions with the goal to eliminate educational inequity. Um, SAG has participated in over seven randomized control research studies, which show strong outcomes on student grades, exam scores, graduation rates, and student self-efficacy. And since 2014, SAGA has served over 20,000 students across Chicago, New York City, Washington, DC, and Florida 
and was recognized among the top five most innovative companies in education worldwide by Fast Company in 2020. Um, our third panelist this evening will be Dr. Monica Bott, who is the Senior Research Director at the University of Chicago Crime Lab and Education Lab. Um, in this role, um, Dr. Bott oversees a portfolio of over a dozen large-scale randomized controlled trials related to reducing crime and improving academic and mental health outcomes for Chicagoans. She's the principal investigator on a number of high-profile studies, including Ready Chicago, an initiative to reduce gun violence involvement among those at highest risk, individualized instruction interventions like high doses tutoring, and also alleviating mental health um, for young women. Prior to coming to the Crime and Education Lab, Dr. Bott worked as a researcher at the American Institute for Research, where she led projects related to college access and retention, teacher quality, school finance, and school accountability. Her academic interests include using data to drive equitable resource allocation and understanding the effects of systemic approaches to reducing disparities in educational attainment and achievement and violence involvement among those who might benefit most. Um, Dr. Bott is a former Fulbright scholar and holds a PhD from the University of Michigan in education policy as well as an MPP and BA in public policy from Vanderbilt University. And um, finally, today's panel will be moderated by John Wolf, who is the Associate Director at the University of Chicago Education Lab. Um, in his role, John helps design and provide strategic guidance and leadership in the Crime Lab and Education Lab's work involving the implementation and scaling up of programs that are implemented by our partners. Um, in his role, John also aims to deepen our understanding of the main facets of program implementation that either support or impede successful program delivery. Um, before coming to the Education Lab, John previously worked as a middle school math teacher through Teach for America in an academically underserved community in Indianapolis. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration from Washington University and a Master's of Arts in Teaching from Marion University in Indianapolis. Um, so again, we're excited to have this esteemed panel with us today. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, John, to get us underway. Great. Thanks so much, Trayvon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jens alluded to the promise of high dosage tutoring and more specifically to the Ed Lab's work with Saga and CPS. This dynamic research practice partnership has generated important evidence about the effectiveness of Saga's high dosage tutoring supporting students' learning. Is learning average up to two to three times that of their peers within one academic year? Our panel today will share some insights from the perspectives of a district policymaker, a practitioner, and researcher into what it takes to generate that kind of evidence, as well as how to then harness that data and evidence in order to scale effective practices and policies for students in their fields. Now, we just heard about all of your impressive backgrounds, but to kick us off, I'm wondering if you could each just take one minute to share how you have come specifically to this partnership between Saga, CPS, and the EdLab. Uh, Antonio, let's start with you. Thank you, John. I mean, um, the inequities we're all talking about right now have existed forever. I mean, we've, um, you know, in the United States, we failed to provide consistently high quality uh, education to students who are low income, uh, which happen to be disproportionately black and brown, and we've consistently failed students who look like me. Um, you know, but I don't accept that. And of course, I understand and recognize that there are many factors that play a role in that. Um, you know, for me, you know, I grew up um, in, in a low income community. And even though my mother really wanted me to do well academically, I made school that sure that school's a priority for me. I still struggled academically, you know, but that changed when I attended high school um, where Alan Safran, the co-founder of Saga, started as the executive director, where he and uh, Michael Goldstein started uh, something very profound in, in my life, which is in school day tutoring. And where I had the opportunity to work alongside a tutor who opted into a year of service to help build my skills, to help me uh, strengthen my understanding of what was going on in the classroom. And that was game changing for me. And so I started Saga Education uh, to create equitable access to something that was so profound in my life. And everyone knows that tutoring is a really great way to help kids. You know, the question is like, how do you do it in a sustainable and cost-effective way? And that's exactly what we're exploring at Saga Education. And Dr. Chavaria, what was your introduction to this work? Absolutely. So in general, I think about this question of, of how do we support students in closing significant academic gaps? I think about the many roles that I've had as an educator and thinking about that problem. So 
I thought about it first as a teacher in my classroom of how do I meet the needs of the 25 students in front of me while also recognizing the individual gap students have on a daily basis. And then as a principal, I thought about how do I set up schedules, routines, and, and staff in a way that allows my teachers to continue to wrestle with that challenge and, and meet the needs of our students. And then I really came to know the Saga Partnership and, and the work that we've done around high dosage tutoring most recently in my role as Chief of Teaching and Learning where I'm asking myself those same questions, but now at a systems level, and in particular, asking that question um, in the moment of this pandemic. So I think about this work and the many hats that I've worn and continue to wear as we think about at a district, how do we create the conditions to really honor the fact that we believe that all students can and should access equitable, rigorous grade level instruction, and yet we have to help them close significant gaps that have accumulated over time. And Dr. Bott, Monica, uh, can you tell us about your engagement with this research portfolio? Sure. Um, you know, I also grew up in a variety of um, different locations and was struck by how the educational system really did have um, the power to help support students to support their social mobility, but it also was a product of the society from which it came. And so, uh, I was constantly struck by persistent disparities that we were seeing in education, both created by policies and systems and structures, um, but also by the opportunities that existed for those very policies and systems and structures to undo those disparities or to, to close some of the gaps. Um, so I've been uh, here at the education lab for the past five years as a research director and had the benefit to join uh, Jens and our other faculty director, John Gurian, and uh, working with Saga Education to help generate this evidence. Because for me, it's about identifying which um, innovative practices are going to be the most effective for students in reading those disparities, um, testing whether or not that's true using the tools that we have in causal inference. And then if they are seen to be uh, effective, understanding how we can take them to scale. It's a, a privilege to be able to do that work at the intersection of relevance and and I think that the education lab is one of the few places where you can really do um, so having very close and deep partnerships with Saga Education and Chicago Public Schools so that we're generating the evidence together, um, but being able to use tools um, that really help to isolate the effect of that particular practice. So we'll say with high degree of confidence that that's the thing that we should be scaling and working towards and focusing on to Kansas. Now, Dr. Chavaria, we know all too well the widespread disruptions the last year and a half has had an educational journey, really, of students across the globe. Uh, we also know that one of the biggest challenges facing school districts as we head into the start of the school year will be addressing unfinished learning caused by the pandemic. And so to ground us, to kick up the conversation, can you discuss what it looked like for Chicago Public Schools? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say that, that as a district, we've been really cautious in how we represent the impact the pandemic has had on, on student learning trajectories, because I think that there is still much that we need to learn, um, of course, from a data perspective, but also from the lived experience of students, teachers, and families. And so, you know, I think that there is emergent data that, that concerns us, as well as data that suggests that the impact has been really uneven. I think that, that one of the things that, that we do know and that we've been really forward in acknowledging and in really thinking about and how we address is that we know that the pandemic has had an uneven impact on students. And in, in various ways, it has exacerbated the racial disparities that already existed in our communities and that we knew existed in our schools. And so we know that, that whatever we do to address and finish learning has to really have a strong equity focus and really be comfortable in knowing that we have to allocate resources to those that were most impacted, but also in those communities that weren't invested in historically. One thing, though, is that we engage with students and with educators around the experience that they've had is that we've heard loud and clear that our educators and our school leaders don't think that this moment should only be characterized by the narrative of loss or of unfinished learning. Um, our students have learned many things. I think many are things that we wish they hadn't had to have learned in this moment, but they have. And, and some of these things are also skills that we think will carry forward and be of value to them in the years to come as educators. So I, I think that it's important to acknowledge the complexity in this moment and to acknowledge that, that the loss and, and the impact is, is extremely varied. 
And so as we think about that complexity as a district, we're really asking ourselves, how do we use this moment to continue to strengthen the daily instructional experiences that students encounter? Because we know there had been gaps previous to the pandemic. And how do we do that while really simultaneously quickly identifying acute student needs for intervention and additional support and connecting those students with those needed supports? And, and we're really thinking of that both in terms of academic need, but also social emotional impacts, recognizing that the pandemic has been disruptive, both in bringing trauma in an acute manner, but also trying to grapple with what the impact might be of prolonged isolation, et cetera. Um, and so for this reason, our broader recovery plan uh, entitled Moving Forward Together has really prioritized some very large initiatives. Um, we are funding, launching a universal digital curriculum, and in particular, really funding the professional learning associated with the implementation of that curriculum as a way to continue to strengthen daily instruction for all students. Um, we're funding mentorship and school-based mental health supports for students at all schools in the district. And we're funding academic interventions uh, through high dosage tutoring, really seeing an opportunity to leverage what we've learned over the last few years to, again, address some of the acute needs that we think have developed for some of our students. And we really think that we're going to learn a lot this year, again, and really asking that question, answering that question of how do we really honor the belief that all students should engage in rigorous instruction while meeting students' holistic needs and closing significant academic gaps. I think we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot as we really endeavor to do that in the years to come. So Antonio, it may seem obvious that providing this to the tutor is an effective way to help them. But one thing we've learned from our work with you all the years is that not all tutoring is created equal. Uh, and so can you talk a little bit about Saga's model and what uh, may set it apart from other um, what people may think of as more traditional tutoring programs? That's a really great uh, question, John. And right now there's a tremendous amount of urgency in getting this right um, because of the national and growing interest in, in tutoring as a way to support youth and as a way to accelerate uh, student learning. And one of the things that, one of the hallmarks of our success as an organization is recognizing that tutoring it's a great tool to leverage when it's embedded in the, into the school day. It's its own class as a graded course for students. And it's so powerful when tutoring is part of the academic ecosystem for students, it creates equitable opportunity, you know, because you know, having tutoring after school, sometimes very challenging for students to participate in, you know, there, there's attendance challenges, there's the, they won't have the opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities, et cetera. So making part of the school day um, is important. Um, having a, a student who work with who can work with a tutor every day or every other day throughout the entire duration of the school year, which is why you may have heard the term high dosage or high impact tutoring, and doing your best to keep those pairings consistent uh, so that the student and tutor can build strong uh, connections and relationships um, with one another. You know, we, we have a saying at Saga, you know, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And really the ability to establish meaningful connections with students is the foundation to unlock um, their academic uh, potential. You know, right now at Saga Education, there are 11 things, uh, 11 hallmarks that are important for implementing a successful high impact tutoring model, which we've posted on our website as well. So if anyone's interested in taking looking at looking at that, uh, we have that listed out for everyone to, to take a look at. And Mona, right now, lots of school districts are talking about high dosage tutoring. You talk a little bit about the research the education has done in this area and what we've learned so far. Sure. Um, so we heard with Saga Education, which was then um, Match Tutoring back, you know, starting in 2012, 2013, and we did um, a series of two different randomized control trials over two years, the 2013-14 school year and the 2014-15 school year of over 5,000 students. And what that meant was in a student, in a particular set of schools um, who volunteered to be part of the study, there were lots of kids who were eligible for um, receiving tutoring services. And uh, some kids got whatever else the school had offering, and some kids were assigned to participate in SAGA Education's tutoring program, which um, Antonio just described was, you know, Every day embedded, the kids got credit for those um, classes, importantly. And because we use this randomized control to isolate the effect 
impact of the program on uh, student outcomes. What we found is that students on average participated in the, um, you know, the saga model, uh, learned two to three times as much uh, math in their uh, one academic year as their peers did. Uh, and this is measured on nice test scores, but we also saw, um, for example, reductions in core math GPA. Um, we saw a 45% reduction in math failures. We saw a 20% reduction in non-math course failure. And kids who participated in high dosage tutoring saw about half a, a letter grade um, improvement on their GPA. So I I've glossed over a, a lot of very positive, statistically significant treatment effects, and we were really excited about them. But what's really striking to me is uh, two things. One, the magnitude of these findings. So um, again, we did two different randomized control trials in the first year. Um, the magnitude was a 0.16 standard deviation increase in, in student test scores. In the second year, um, it was an increase of you know 0.37 standard deviation. So even bigger in that second year of implementation. And the we could replicate these findings was the with the other you know second most striking thing. And what we've done over time is to continue to partner with Saga Education to say, great, that was a model in which you had two kids working with one tutor. Um, but it, and it was um, at, a, you know, it was we were able to do that, you know, at modest scale in a lower urban school district like Chicago Public Schools with about 5000 students. But the question was, how could we push even further? And so over time, we've partnered um, to look at studies where maybe you can have four students that work with one tutor and the students spend half the time um, on an adaptive learning platform like Alex Math or Khan Academy. And by that, you reduce the cost of tutoring by about 50%. And we want to know, can you preserve the effects? So hopefully the results of um, study will be out soon, but the preliminary effects show that the results are really promising. And we think you can um, lower the cost by increasing the, the ratio of students to tutors uh, and still preserve the effect using this model with a reminder that it still has the hallmarks of those you know, 11 touch points uh, that still classify this as high dosage tutoring. But what we're really trying to do in partnering with CPS on this larger moving forward together initiative, which is you know, using the America Rescue Plan dollars set aside for COVID learning loss, can we take knowledge? If we know that this is really effective and we run replication trials and over and over again across content, you know, we did a small little pilot with little kids um, and literacy, and we're seeing similar effects and sizes. We, you know, work in New York, across geography. Um, if we can replicate these findings, the question isn't necessarily uh, we need to search high and low for the intervention to support students to reduce disparities. The question is, um, as AJ and Shirley have both said, how can we do that at scale in a way that's systematic? And how can we start to you know, codify this kind of intervention into the systems and structures um, and the in the daily work of how we administer schooling, you know, in our school systems, whether it's in school districts like Chicago Public Schools or, or even smaller school systems. And, and that's really the question that we're at. You know, I would really like to get everyone's reaction to the dynamic process that Monica just described. We have found that it's so important to build inclusive partnerships to enable research agendas like this to really flourish. Uh, and so can each of you discuss from your own perspective, what is the most important piece in creating a successful partnership between policymakers, practitioners, uh, and researchers? And what advice would you have as trying to replicate this, uh, this type of partnership? Um, maybe, uh, Dr. Chavarria, let's start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I think number one, from our perspective, um, we're hungry for the partnership and hungry for what we learn from the partnership. So um, we don't see the work as, as, as serving an external agenda, but rather as part of our own continuous improvement efforts. And for that reason, um, despite whatever distractions may come to onto the plate from a central perspective, we continue to prioritize the partnership, um, establishing the systems and structures that allow it to be successful. And I think that what needs to happen for such work to be successful is clear alignment between external partners, central office representatives, and the school, uh, because so much can be lost in translation. Um, and we really need clear alignment on what the vision is for the work and what success looks like. 
and then to have systems in, and structures in place to really monitor to ensure that the thing that we think we're doing is actually the thing that's happening in schools every single day. I think that, that again, that'll also be part of, of what we're going to learn from is how do we replicate that success at scale when we're thinking about so many more different schools? And particularly if we think about high dosage tutoring as we're describing it here, how do we help a large system understand what this is and what this isn't? Um, you know, we opened up, AJ opened up with the comments about this isn't homework help and, and not everyone in the system understands what high dosage tutoring can and should be and what it takes to really make it work from a scheduling and logistics perspective um, for schools. And Antonio, you've been an integral part of this effort from the very beginning. Uh, what is maybe something that uh, when you look back, uh, you look back on as a vital piece of process that you would not have expected at the onset? Well, first I want to echo all my incredible team who's been part of this process since the beginning. I wish I could take all the credit, but I absolutely can't. Um, I, I, the, the first thing I want to say is, um, and I've learned this from the University of Chicago, you know, randomized control studies are really rare in education um, when it really shouldn't be. And one thing that makes this partnership work um, and what I think is really special is the um, Chicago Public Schools and the city of Chicago's um, commitment to using evidence-based practices and, and their willingness to engage in randomized control research studies with an open heart and open mind. You, def you definitely have to give a lot of credit to both of them, um, um, the city and the Department of Education for doing that. And, and in turn, they really have paved the way nationally in terms of the thinking around this issue. And so uh, the most important thing that has led to success is this district's commitment to that. Uh, and, and then the other piece I think is important is that as SAGA education, we're very, you know, we're data-driven geeks and, you know, we're not a one and done kind of organization. We continually want, continually want to explore what what different permutations um, that we can implement that will lead to success that's more cost effective. And technology is going to play a significant role. And then, as Monica mentioned, we're using blended learning. Um, we have innovative models uh, with respect to online learning as well. Of course, COVID-19 ex has accelerated our, our interest in thinking around that. But of course, we were doing that well before the COVID-19 pandemic. And even this year, uh, we have uh, six different models that we're trying out nationwide in, in all of our cities. And so I think the willingness to um, really want to understand how to try different things out and understand our the impact of their approach as we test new things has been really important to success and helping to lift uh, the field of high impact tutoring. So, so much gratitude for Chicago, uh, the city of Chicago and Chicago Public Schools for their willingness to to, to be an important part, partner that's been part of this journey. And, and that is one thing that I uh, would be remiss if I didn't also just sort of highlight or underscore that through our work with uh, saga, just the ability, uh, the interest to iterate and try um, new visions and not sort of settle on, oh, we found one that works, we have evidence, you know, let's just go out and do that. But the uh, the appetite to continue to learn and to iterate and to drill down on what is the most effective way to do it in a way that can serve the most kids, I think that is something that um, you don't find, we don't always um, find. Um, and, you know, it takes a lot of courage to really look under the hood and figure out what works and what doesn't. And so just um, wanted to commend you all on that approach to our engagement. Um, and then lastly, Monica, we don't work with CPS years. How has that partnership grown and evolved over time? Um, well, you know, I think that it's only deepened over time. And so we began, the, the Saga um, series of studies really came from um, some of the Becoming a Man work that we had done where we were seeing uh, reductions in arrests for women who are participating in the program. Um, and we were seeing an increase in school engagement, but unsurprisingly, because um, Becoming a Man is a group-based counseling program and not instructional program, seeing movement on GPA. But we thought if kids are coming to school more, how can we um, make that experience as beneficial to students as possible? Um, and did a national search for uh, intervention in an organization that, that might be effective, some promise. Um, but, you know, for the past, I would say, eight years, we've been doing work um, that really focuses on instruction, um, you know, on its own and in it, right? And so the ideas of those very few projects that we started on, you know, thinking about how to increase attendance to a program called Check In and Connect, uh, only deepened over time. And 
I think the difference that I see is that those disparate uh, studies and randomized control trials, while always done in partnership with the district in the city of Chicago, have um, uh, become embedded as part and parcel of how the district is doing business. So, for example, in the Moving Forward Together work, um, one of the ideas that we've always focused on is, you know, how to use data to prioritize students for um, scarce resource intensive services. And that kind of um, data use for resource equity is built into the idea of moving forward together in, in the framework through student prioritization index, I think because we've done repeated work over time. Um, and just to answer your question a little bit earlier about what it takes to do this work, I think one reason that we've been able to be so successful in taking you know, side education, which was done in a handful of schools with a few thousand students. And now I think there are about 3000 students who are reading SAGA education services. But again, that idea has been codified in work together using federal dollars to stand up what I think is the first, um, you know, tutoring core run by a school district through the CPS tutor core, which will serve, um, you know, tens of thousands of students moving forward. And so I, I think that the codification of those ideas uh, because of those deep relationships and because we work exclusively and you know almost exclusively here in Chicago have a deep footprint means that it's a repeated game and I hope that you know Chicago Public Schools in the city of Chicago and our partners who are here know that uh, our interest is because we are also residents of the city you know the university of chicago is also an institution in the city and, and we do feel that generating this evidence is part of the survey we owe um for everything that the city has has given us and so that kind of reciprocal relationship and mutualism i think is really important to to generating this work and hopefully is evidenced um in the work that cps and the education lab and saga will do moving forward John, can I commandeer your session and just add one more thing? Of course. Um, I, the, I think the last thing I want to share, and it's really important, um, is that as Saga, we recognize we have to have a practical approach when it comes to scaling evidence-based practices. And um, Saga, you know, you know, can't be the sole provider at, you know, you know, implementing tutoring nationwide. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. And if we really want to create systems change so that schools can rethink their approach to budgeting, rethink their approach to human capital, and re 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 uh, uh, change their approach to um, scheduling, um, we have to find a way to help build the capacity of districts and other organizations to replicate what we do. And so we've taken a, a big step in that direction right now as an organization um, by providing technical su support on program design and implementation, and also by sharing broadly the technological resources we use uh, as practitioners uh, to support our students. And so that's another important thing um, that is part of our approach as an organization to, to share what we know to be best practices. And I'm really excited that Chicago Public Schools is taking a step in that direction and, and building out its own uh, tutoring core. And, and that's exactly the, the type of system change we want to see nationwide. And we're excited about the possibility of being a partner and helping strengthen their work in that area and also other organizations and districts who are, who are taking a step in this direction as well. Uh, I'm you interjected that it was also sort of a rather timely uh, transition to next set of questions, which is, you know, I want to zero in a little bit uh, since the first day of school for CPS is only six days away. Uh, so I want to look very shortly uh, ahead to the future, to the return of students to the classroom, and really hear um, a bit about how each of you think that this work can help uh, in supporting students upon their return. So, uh, Dr. Maria, uh, to start with you, um, at a system level, as CPS gears up for the fall, um, and but as we've been talking about um, throughout the evening, really this fall but beyond, um, can you discuss how the district is working to identify student needs and provide personalized support? For example, um, you, you hit on this a little bit um, through the new CPS tutoring core, um, whether it's using the SPI, but for all students across the district. Happy to, to address that question. And I think that, that in a system like ours that has, has been so data-driven over the years, 
Um, the issue for me hasn't been about identifying student needs, but rather agreeing across all levels of the system and in all places of the system on who we're supporting and how we're supporting that student and what impacts we're seeking to have on those students. And also agreeing on then accordingly how we allocate resources. And so Monica mentioned this already, but we work in partnership with the education lab to create what we're calling the student prioritization index. And this is going to be really key in how we think about how we identify students who need support um, in this moment and in the years to come. And what the SPI does is that we're using multiple data points to really provide a holistic database summary uh, uh, to support schools in identifying students who could benefit of additional interventions. I think it's really important to say that, that to me, the SPI is the starting point for a school community or for a group of practitioners to have a conversation. Uh, it shouldn't be the only tool used to really identify supports for students. But the index really looks um, at data from SY21 and SY20 for the last two school years around the areas of student engagement, academic performance, and social emotional needs. And then we also have included additional community factors such as COVID case rates, violent crime rates, et cetera, student mobility. And the intent here is that we help schools have a holistic capture in one place to begin to identify students who they think may need additional supports. This summer, we've already used the SPI to begin to identify students who we believe might be at risk to not return this fall and use the SPI accordingly to then uh, support those students through re-engagement efforts, whether that be phone calls, uh, home visits, et cetera. And we also use the SPI to, to target students to prioritize them for student programming. But the, what we've been doing is that it helps create a nuance. And so instead of saying, hey, the student is uh, truant, we can also look across the board and see that the student also um, had significant grade decline in the past two years uh, and also had high levels of trauma. So that kind of data profile gives us a direction that might be different than a student who maybe was just out um, multiple days but didn't have the other areas of concern present. And so as we think about the year ahead, we'll continue to use the SPI to help us identify students, to connect them to, to interventions. And, and as, as has been spoken about already, probably one of the largest academic interventions that we're funding is our tutor core program. And we are, again, seeking to launch scaled tutoring across the district, um, high dosage tutoring as it's been defined in this space, really focused on early literacy. Uh, so we'll be deploying tutors for K through five literacy, as well as middle school and high school math, really seeking again to, to implement what we've learned. Uh, we believe that these two places are most high leverage places and Yen's comments actually align perfectly with the, the investments that we're making. And they've also used um, broader, re broader indicators to help us decide where to allocate those resources of the tutors. So as well as some of the student performance data, we've also considered historical path, um, historical path patterns of investment in those school communities, as well as larger community factors such as COVID case rates. So we, we believe that we have created a nuanced system that's going to allow us after this period of time in thinking about how we've used ESSER funds to, to be able to clearly say how we identified students for supports, to really identify what supports those students received, and in the end also speak to what impact those supports had on students. So we're excited to, to have this plan in place and, and to really make it real in the year ahead. And Antonio, we've heard about your model and the incredible impact that SAGA delivers. And, and just now we heard a little bit about your efforts to scale those active ingredients across both providers and districts. Um, but I'm wondering, can you describe how your work has had to be nimble and adjust the shifting landscape we're dealing with now? Um, and, and maybe including you, and again, this is probably something you've already teed up, but including what initiatives are on the horizon for SAGA? First, I want to say I'm just deeply proud and excited for Chicago Public Schools with its uh, step in direction with tutoring. It really fires me up. I mean, this is why I decided to do what I, what I do at Saga is, is to, to help inspire this kind of change. I mean, this what they're doing is, is real systems change, and uh, it just um, it means a lot to see that. Uh, but in terms of the against the backdrop of COVID-19, um, what's exciting is that you know Saga has always been. Um, has, has was exploring online instruction even before the COVID-19 pandemic um, kind of shifted uh, all of our lives completely around. And we were piloting an online um, tutoring pilot in partnership with College Board uh, in the virtual classroom space. And so when the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, 
we're able to draw from those resources and experiences to help inform our approach moving forward. And we know from preliminary data from uh, an RCT uh, that you know um, they, we can have we can maintain our instructional goals even online. And so we knew going into that that we could have a, a strong outcomes for students. Um, so we were able to kind of leverage our online um, virtual classroom to, to provide that instructional support uh, to youth. There's something our engineering team developed. Uh, so we developed that tool in-house. You know, a resource like Zoom is not designed with educators in mind. It doesn't have the manipulatives or the whiteboard or the content you need to provide high quality instruction. And so we were able to use that tool uh, as much as we can. Of course, the, the challenge is that, you know, there's variability in how each district approached um, supporting students. And there was also variability from a school basis by school basis. So um, as an organization, there wasn't a blanket wider approach we took. Um, and so and so we did our best to try to be good partners to the schools. Uh, and our site directors took it from a case by case basis, really trying to assess what the um, what the school really needed. And that's what's exciting about tutoring and making it part of the the academic ecosystem is that you can provide that customization and collaboration to try to support in line with what the classroom teachers are doing uh, and trying to support the, uh, the schools as best as we can. And so there wasn't a, a, a national national wide approach that we took, but um, we did our best to, to have best communication as possible with our principals who, by the way, at the same time, were trying to figure things out uh, as things progress on their own. Now we've got about four or five minutes and then we wanna transition um, get to a couple of audience questions that are coming through. So I wanna close um, briefly, so about maybe 90 seconds or so uh, for answers what we have time for, but I wanna ask a version of a question that um, I think we sometimes like to ask our either school partners or providers, and if it has a little bit of a different flavor maybe, um, Dr. Maria, spe specifically for you, given the influx uh, of funding from the American Rescue Plan. What I'd like to ask is, you know, as a result of the American Rescue Plan, districts across the U.S., including CPS, have received really an unprecedented amount of additional funding to help address you know, many of the things that we've been talking about this evening. Um, and so what I want to know, I guess, is in a dream world, what, if any, areas would you personally love to invest even more in um, if you had uh, additional resources? Again, this is a, a different maybe flavor because there was just such a giant infusion of resources, but I think, you know, um, if there was something that um, maybe you weren't able to get to or something that long-term big picture you'd like to take a, a shot at, what is something that um, if could uh, sort of wave a magic wand you would really like to make a bet in? Is that me and my first? Um, <laughs> you know, I think that that I we feel very confident about some of the the, the the initiatives that we've resourced. If anything, the thing that I wish is is that we could know that the funding would be sustained over a long period of time. I think that that many of us have, have publicly commented on the the ramps to to stand up such, such large scale initiatives are extremely aggressive, um, and so. I think that that we would like more time. We'd like more time to learn from what we do in these next two years and continue to sustain that work. And so to me, that that's all. Not not more, just sustaining, because we know that the impact of the pandemic will be long lasting um, and won't be addressed in the two to three years that, that the funding is available for. And Antonio, a similar question for you. What, um, you hinted at it a little bit, but what's next for Saga? Um, big picture three, five years down the line? Like what is a big bet that you all are uh, really excited about exploring? Oh man, there's so much I could share on this. Some of it's G4 classified, so I can't share that information with you. But we're ex really excited about uh, um, how to, the extent to which we can leverage adaptive learning technology and online instruction to continue to make tutoring cost effective. Um, just broadly speaking, you know, can the relationships develop with the tutors help students take that time more seriously? And if the students are taking that time more seriously, can the data generated from that help inform the tutorial? And so that's that's a really interesting um, area we're exploring. And another thing about online instruction that's appealing is that if you're no longer constrained by geography, you can dramatically open the pool of applicants who could do this work. Um, of course, there's the trade-off where, you know, if a, 
is there a trade-off with, with, with the relationship building aspect if a, a student's not there with their tutor? Um, and so the question is, we, well, we know the relationship won't be the same, but um, is it worth the, 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 the benefit? Is, is, in terms of a cost of benefit analysis, is, is it worth that trade-off? And so that's another area where we're excited to explore as well. And then lastly, Monica, I want to ask you about where the work of Education Lab is headed next. Um, as we've touched on, well, the pandemic has highlighted and exacerbated numerous disparities uh, in our society, from you know, educational to health and economic opportunities. Um, these often include external factors that can both obviously impact a student's ability to succeed in the classroom but might be more effectively addressed by partners outside of the school system uh, in some instances. And so I wanna conclude um, this conversation with your thoughts on how we, we could or we should be thinking more holistically about supporting students. Sure, and you know, I, th I thought um, Jens did a really good job of talking about uh, how even specific interventions can have positive spillover um, effects that, that we're trying to capture. So uh, certainly thinking about personalized learning, personalized instruction is going to be you know, a big part of our portfolio looking forward. And that's something that is squarely within the focus of control of schools and school districts. Um, thinking about you know, how we, can we use um, adaptive learning platforms? How can we continue to lower the cost of high dosage tutoring and expand access to it? Um, such that more kids can benefit. So, so that's certainly going to be a focus, continuing to build on you know the past decade of work that we've been doing. I think in addition to that, um, you know, one thing that we really like to focus on are thinking about students who are not yet benefiting from the progress that has been made over the past you know two decades in um, getting kids to high school graduation. So there's been enormous progress getting kids to high school graduation, um, and you know. The U.S. boasts one of the highest educational attainment rates of any OECD country worldwide. Um, but we know that there are still students who um, don't benefit and don't even get to high school graduation, even when the returns to a high school graduate, you know, high school graduation are paling in comparison to the returns to post-secondary schooling, which is a different way of saying that we're deeply concerned about inequity with respect to not only performance within schools, as uh, indicated by a personalized instructional uh, portfolio, but also attainment. So getting kids to high school graduation and in Chicago public schools, for example, we know that there's 4,500 students every single year who don't graduate from high school. And, and I think that one thing I would love to see more of um, is how can we use a public health approach to understand who these students are and who their families are and have the school district take the lead, uh, but corral other governmental agencies who might have touch points with those very students and their families to try to figure out how we can better administer social service supports to them. Because you might have students for whom, for example, they're experiencing housing instability or um, elevated rates of trauma exposure due to elevated rates of gun violence, um, as we know from some of our other work. Um, and the question is really not how can the school system be uh, reimagined to address each of those needs on its own, but rather how can it be the lead as a universal touch point for you know, children and families in the US to say uh, the school district is taking the lead on things that are within their locus of control and there are other governmental agencies who can, who can help support. So I think that that kind of whole of government response is one thing that I would you know, like to see in an ideal world and um, figuring out how we can be better coordinated and build capacity in a coordinated way is something that I'm really excited about. Okay, thank you all. Um, you're off the hot seat with me. Uh, we're gonna transition over to some questions for the audience. We've got about eight or nine minutes. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to get through all of them, um, but would like to try to get as many as possible. Uh, so I'm gonna start. Um, Monica, this is I think, directed towards you, but also Trevor, I would love your, your input as well. Um, is there a fundamental conflict between personalization and standardized, standardized measures of educational progress? Sure. Um, sure. I, I can infer a little bit about 
what that question might be asking, which is um, a concern that I might have. So for example, when you have um, personalization, you might worry that the very individuals that are um, trying to assess where a kid is and develop appropriate supports might do so on mentions um, that exacerbate inequities in lieu of closing them. But I think our conception of personalized uh, learning and education is really much more standardized than that. So I would say two things. One, I think the standardization of measurement actually helps us here because you're trying to understand where disparities are and then understand the kind of support that's going to be the most effective. Um, so you're not allowing individuals to determine on their own what's considered um, a student to be high performing or not. I also think that it allows you to be much, much more nuanced. So it's not high performing versus low performing. We don't have to get bogged down in these binaries, but it's, you know, are you struggling with math fluency concepts, you know, at this particular grade level? Are you struggling with, you know, triple digit uh, multiplication? And then you're able to shore up those skill gaps. And then finally, I would say that, um, we have empirical evidence that shows that this kind of approach can be really effective, not just for students at the top of the distribution, but all along the distribution. Um, and I think that that's really encouraging because otherwise what we see in educational interventions is um, they work, you know, it's the more, the more. So they work really well for kids at the top end of the distribution and not so well for kids at the bottom end of the distribution, but high dosage tutoring doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and I think that's encouraging because then it has the promise of you know, closing some of the persistent disparities that we can we can measure using standardized tools. So I don't think that they are um, inclusive or with one another. In fact, I actually think that they can be complementary tools um, to help us where kids are and then appropriately sort of intervene or serve them. Dr. Chavarria, this one uh, is for you. You touched on this a bit uh, earlier, but what role can social emotional learning play in the return to school process, especially for students affected by trauma from the pandemic, racial unrest, and isolation over the past year and a half? Yeah, there are a couple things that I always like to highlight when we think about social emotional learning, and I think that um, there are a lot that term can mean a lot for a lot of different stakeholders. I think number one um, that addressing the social emotional needs of students is not in conflict with academic progress; the two go in concert, and and it's something that we as a district have really been elevating. That if a student doesn't feel safe in the classroom, if they don't feel seen, if their identity, their community, the relationships aren't attended to, then we haven't created the conditions for the kind of risk-taking that true learning requires. And so we see attending to those needs as really being um, instrumental. And we think about how we um, recover and begin to think about next steps from the pandemic. In fact, just um, last week, we released a guidance document called Starting with the Heart, really continuing to signal to, to all of our educators that we're sincere in that commitment to beginning with student well-being as the pathway towards academic recovery. I think the second is to recognize also that there is a need to provide um, structured intervention that addresses students' acute social emotional needs perhaps caused by trauma. So I think that we see ourselves attending to both universal need, climate and culture in the classroom, as well as resourcing students' um, in students' acute social emotional needs. This, I think either um, Antonio or uh, plan for sharing these results morally, um, you know, both other cities school districts, as well as to other CBOs and nonprofits, whether it's in Chicago or um, across the country? Well, there are many things. I mean, we, we established a team at Saga Education. They're fully dedicated to sharing best practices um, on implementation from, from every aspect of this approach. And so we're providing that support. We're also um, developing tools that districts can use to, to support their tutoring program. One of the things to take into account when launching a high impact tutoring model is, is your approach to um, training and ongoing professional development for tutors. And so one of the things we've done at Saga is codified our best practices in training uh, components of effective tutoring 
Uh, we developed a scalable basic training tool that's free for any district to use. It's a three to four hour training portal. Uh, so if you have a tutoring core, they could go to our website, sign up for Saga Coach for free uh, and go through that course and receive a certification on, on basic training. And so that's one example of a tool that we're creating that um, can allow us to share and disseminate best practices. And we, we expect to build on that platform over time uh, to continue to add content. Another way we've done that is broadly making available our curriculum for, for mathematics. Um, you know, our curriculum is designed with the tutorial context in mind. Most curriculum out there is really focused on, on teachers. And so uh, that resource we use is a really great tool, especially for rookie educators to provide uh, instruction. And so that's another resource we've made broadly available on our website as well. Monica, I'm wondering anything that you would add about the Education's Lab efforts to disseminate and share findings from the research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we are wading into the world of uh, podcasts and uh, non-traditional <laughs> dissemination methods. Um, we're, of course, going to keep pushing forward on um, making sure that we have a peer-reviewed journal article so that, you know, the scientific aspects of what we're talking about are, are peer reviewed and vetted um, and such there. But ultimately, um, we do a lot of this this kind of, thing. you know, I, I wish it could be in person, but we do want to make sure that we're talking to school districts and so um, and sharing what we've learned. And so there um, are a number of different um, mediators, brokers, uh, platforms uh, of organizations that convene school districts. And so we're continuing to push out that information um, a, as much as we can. So we'll talk to everyone and everyone about what we've learned and what we think the promise is to learn moving forward, especially as school districts tr start to, you know, invest in their own forms of high usage tutoring. Um, and, you know, hopefully through our work also, um, you know, Brown University, the Annenberg Institute has a robust research agenda around high usage tutoring. Um, so there's a lot of interest and excitement on this, and um, I think everyone's trying to figure out what it is, how to do it well, how to learn from it. You know, there, there are so many other things to learn, so so absolutely. All right, we have two and a half minutes left, but there are two questions I asked. So I um, would ask that these answers are, are short and sweet, um, and hopefully this one will be. Uh, first, how exactly is CPS using Saga? Involved in the tutoring core? Are they providing direct services? Um, how, how are they being utilized? And at this time, we have a contract with Saga where they directly deliver um, tutoring services to a small portfolio of uh, high schools in the district. Uh, that, that's how we currently partner with Saga. And then I think this is uh, the end on, and Monica, I'll start with you, but um, of course, uh, Dr. Trevoria, please, please, and uh, if you have anything to add, which is, how would you define the role between advocacy and empirical social science? Adversarial, complementary, sequential, um, how would you describe that relationship? Um, sure, I, I mean, I think advocacy is usually oriented around a specific policy platform um, that you wanna see advanced. Um, I think if you think about the public policy space, there are lots of ways to affect change. And I see the role of social science is squarely being um, in, in terms of evidence generation uh, to inform policymaking. But ultimately, you know, policymakers are the decision makers. And so the evidence generation we can do um, in partnership, we can make sure that we're disseminating it through a variety of avenues. We can make sure that people um, know and understand what it means and what its implications might be. Um, but ultimately, you know, uh, social science research are not the decision makers. And I think that evidence, uh, we know actually from some research in this area that uh, evidence is input and a growing input and a key input into policymakers' decision making process, but certainly not the only input. Um, as it should be, because you have to think about, as Jens mentioned, your local constituency, um, you know, what the various politics are, what you're weighing that against, what the counterfact was, and all of those inputs um, are very appropriate. We just think that the role of evidence is also an important one, and we want to make sure we're doing our part in generating that kind of evidence so that you know, if there is a question about 
uh, what is effective and for whom we're able to answer that. I mean, at Saga Education, we recognize that there are levers you can pull in the state and federal level to help support um, implementation of high impact tutoring uh, broadly. And so um, our approach to that is by, you know, setting up a series of briefings with um, staffers and offices on, on, on Capitol Hill on just sharing what we know to be uh, best practices and also working to um, develop model legislation that states could take into consideration as a um, so that they put in place the frameworks that would really lead to success. So if a state's interested in allocating funding from a from a state level to a district level, um, we've also provided some guidance and support in that area as well. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Uh, that concludes our conversation for the evening. I wanna first thank everyone for joining. I sincerely hope that you got uh, as much out of this conversation as I did. Uh, and also thank you uh, so much to the Harris Communications team for hosting. Uh, and most of all, thanks to Dean Baker, Jens, and uh, all of our panels here for sharing all of your insights and expertise. Uh, again, we're the University of Chicago Education Lab. If you're interested in connecting with us and more about either this or any of our other work, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.